So I train new investors on how to pick startups, which isn't easy. It's not like picking a public stock, which also isn't easy, um, but it's even harder because the information isn't public and you have to know how to analyze these companies. Founder Space brings in early stage startups, startups that a lot of times haven't proven out their business model. You know, they might have a great team, a great technology. They may have even launched a product, but they're at the early stages. And what we help them do is figure it out, figure out what to do next, how to overcome obstacles, how to raise capital, and then ultimately how to scale their business. People get confused between incubator and accelerator. So most people use them interchangeably. But um, honestly, um, incubators tend to be for earlier stage startups and accelerators tend to be for a little later stage startups. They still aren't you know, going like a rocket ship, but they're further along. Angel investing is when you come in at an early stage to a young company and you invest usually not huge amounts of money. There are what are called super angels who may put in a million dollars or more, but most angel investors put in around $100,000, even less into these startups at a very early stage. Now, venture capital comes later. That comes usually after the startup has proven out its business and it actually needs a lot of capital to grow and scale that business. And then in between angel, angel and traditional venture capital is kind of a seed round. And a seed round gets you over that hump. It's like the angels have taken you only so far, but you need more money to actually prove out your model. You get that in the seed round. And in the seed round, uh, there are venture capital firms that specialize in that. Finding the next Facebook isn't easy. I mean, we read about it. We read about all these unicorns. We think like, well, if we pick any startup, it, it's probably going to go and we're going to be gazillionaires. But it doesn't work that way. Actually, over 90% of the startups don't make it. They simply never become unicorns. And most of them actually fail outright. You'll lose all your money. So if you're just throwing darts, if you're out there just picking whatever startup comes across your path, you know, there's maybe a 95% chance that you will not see any return on your investment because even experienced investors have trouble. Now, in order to get in to one of these unicorns, you have to do it at an early stage because by the time it's it's really going, by the time it's taking off and becoming a unicorn, that's when all the big investors step in and they will lock you out of the deal. They don't want all these angels around. They want all the equity for themselves. So really the, the only time that the average person can get into one of these deals is at a very early stage. But at a very early stage, there isn't a lot of information to to base your decision on. So how do you know, you know, if, if there's an over 90% fail rate, how do you know the startup you're picking has any chance of success? Finding these deals is a challenge in and of itself. So most people like myself, I'm an investor, I come out of Silicon Valley, but now I invest all over the world in startups. I find these deals a lot of different ways. Number one, I'm kind of lucky. So I have what's called high deal flow. Like I have a lot of deal flow because founder space, my startup incubator and accelerator gets a lot. It's very well known and we get submissions from thousands of startups a year submitting their business plans. So that's one way. But um, for most and most people, they don't have that network. I'm also an author. I wrote several books that gets me even more uh, incoming business plans. But most people don't have that. So what they end up doing is relying on their network, their personal network, who they know. And even in Silicon Valley, a lot of the best deals don't come over the transom. They aren't random submissions, you know, from your website or, or wherever. They are actually introductions by other investors who have already vetted the deal and they want a second opinion or they're bringing you in because you're their friend. So if you really want to be able to get the best deals, you have to start forming a network. Now, this may seem hard, but it's not as hard as you might imagine because there are now angel groups who angel fund startups all over the world. Like you can find them not just across the United States, but you can find them in Istanbul, in Shenzhen, in Berlin, you name it. They're, they're these groups that have gotten together 
and they are working together as teams to vet out startups. And that's a really great way to get the deal flow at the beginning and learn a lot. So we have our own system. I've actually uh, developed the system over years for analyzing startups, and I'll share some of that with you right now. So when you look at an early stage startup, you f you're kind of going in blind because the, you know most of them, they don't have a lot of user growth. They may have none. They maybe just have, they're developing their product right now. They probably don't have a lot of revenue um, or else all the big guys would be chasing them. So th they're in a very early stage. What you need to do is go below the surface and start to look at the other aspects of their business. So the number one thing I look for when I go to a startup at an early stage is who's the team? Who's the CEO? What traits do they have that makes them exceptional? How do I know that, that this team can actually execute? Because I will tell you, a lot of people base it on the idea, but the idea, you can have a great idea, but if the team isn't up to par, they will fumble the ball. That, that startup will never get off the ground. They can have the best idea in the world, but if they don't have a good team, somebody else is going to execute better than them and they are never going to get out of the gate. So I tell, what I, the first thing I do is spend a lot of time analyzing the founders, talking to them, asking them questions. And I really want to understand First of all, the most important founder of all is the CEO. The CEO is going to define everything. So how do I judge a good CEO from, you know, a loser or a mediocre CEO who will never really build this unicorn? What I, the first thing I look at is kind of obvious, but a lot of people don't pay a lot of attention to it. And that is who did this CEO bring onto their team? Did they bring experienced people onto their team? People who have... Uh, who could be working at Google or Facebook or IBM or some big company earning six-figure salaries, doing incredibly well, but they decided to take a risk and join this startup because they believe not only in the idea, but also in the CEO. So that's my first litmus test. You know, if the CEO comes to me and said, and there's a lot of solopreneurs, they call them solo entrepreneurs, who, you know, they literally start off on their own. They don't, they, they don't have a team. They might hire some contractors or something to get the programming done, but they almost invariably fail. And I will tell you why. The reason is because you never build a billion dollar company with just one person. It never happens. I mean, if you're going to build a billion dollar company, you're going to need other people. And the most important people are the people you start with. Those people at the beginning set the tone and they hire all the other people. So if you don't bring on great people at the beginning, you're automatically crippling yourself as a startup. So I spend a lot of time with analyzing the CEO, who the other team members are on what their dynamic is, how they interact with each other. Why did they join this startup? What prompted them to do that? All those motivations, really important. And then finally, in regards to the team, and the team is only one aspect. I'll go into the others later. But in regards to the team, the final thing is when you started this company, you know, uh, we, what did you do? How did you think about it? How did you analyze the situation? I want to see how their mind works. I want to see what have they done in the past? This team, these team members, have they done anything successful? Like even if they're just out of college, did they do anything exceptional? Like in college, did they organize groups? Did they have some sort of success? I want to see that. And if I can wrap my head around that and really feel I know them, then it's a green light. I'll move to analyzing the next steps. So the next thing I look for is I'm very concerned uh, with uh, their product, right? And one of the questions I always ask early on is, who are your customers? And if honestly, if they can't tell me who their customers are, I am very hesitant to move forward. Like, I don't want them to just say, my customers are women. That's not enough. I want them to say, my customers are teenage girls who live in this demographic. You know, they watch these type of movies. They shop in these stores. I want them to know every single thing about their customer and why their customer is buying the product. So if, if people who understand their customer, they 
understand what they're making because you're always making something for somebody. There has to be a strong need out there. So by telling me about their customer, by actually having spent the time with their customer and really understanding the business and why that customer must have this product over all the other products in the world, what, what it does, what's in their head, that's the second most important thing. And then the third thing I look for, uh, which is important, is the product itself. What does this product do? This product, it may not be fully built, but what does it do that is different from everything else out there? Because I will tell you, even if somebody says I have no competitors, they have competitors because people are doing something else to get the job done. Whatever they, you, why, you know, if it's a, if it's a B2B app, they're doing it with pen and paper. They're doing it some other way, you know, maybe not with the latest technology, but they're getting the job done to run their business some other way. So what is it that you're going to do? What are you offering them and what impact will that have? If it's consumers, like if it's a new social app or whatever it is, they're spending their time somewhere else. Even if your app never existed, their attention is focused somewhere else. How are you going to pull them away from that and focus it on your app? And I have a rule about this. If your solution that you've come up with, the value you're offering your customer is only incrementally better than any, any other thing that, that's already on the market, you as an entrepreneur have already failed. You need to start over because incremental improvements go nowhere. Like honestly, the world is too competitive. You're never going to build one of these hyper growth unicorns by being incrementally better. They're really honestly only two ways that, uh, that startups break through. And if they don't do one of these two things, I don't invest. So number one, um, the number one way is they do something that's exponentially better. They're taking usually, new technology or a new way of doing things and offering it to their customer that allows their customer to do something either so much more efficiently than they've done it before or brings in so many more customers or boosts their revenue by so much that they cannot live without this product. Once they see this product, they have to have it. So uh, that kind of exponential value creation, really important. You know, and I give you a million examples of this, of startups. You know, Google, a lot of people think, wow, Google, you know, they, they were, you know, they created an incredible search engine and they just won. Well, it wasn't like that. There were 19 other search engines out of the gate ahead of Google and they had huge user bases and Google didn't have, you know, anybody when they launched. Now, Google, uh, what they did was they didn't just build another search engine like everybody else. They developed a new algorithm, their page ranking algorithm, that actually provided meaningful results, exponentially more meaningful results than all the other competitors out there. And that key element allowed Google to leapfrog everybody else and become the default search engine. It's sort of a winner take all world. So we really want the best in the category. And if you're not gonna be the best, um, an angel investor shouldn't put their money into them. The number two way, is if you can't be exponentially better, you have to be different. Meaning, not just you have extra features and things like that, but you have to offer a core value to your customer that is totally, um, that is totally different than the other people on the market. Like you do one thing, and it, you don't have to do everything well, but you do one thing that nobody else does. And for that reason, customers will adopt your product because they really need that thing done. So um, either you be different or you be exponentially better. And if you can't be either, you uh, don't invest in the startup. <laughs> it's as simple as that. There are a lot of different types of companies out there. But when you're investing, you have to think about what you get out of the deal, not whether it's going to be a decent business for the entrepreneur that runs the business. But as the investor, you are taking a risk. And I will honestly tell you, if you invest in most small businesses, the risk level is almost the same as investing in a potential unicorn. You know, most of them don't succeed. Uh, there's a little lower failure rate, but honestly, the risk versus reward is what matters to you as an investor. Now, investing, let's say, in a dry cleaning uh, business, you know, 
maybe they are cash flow positive from day one. Maybe they, um, you know, they have a really great location and a really great formula. But if they don't have a big plan to scale out and franchise this, and, and they don't have a unique edge that will allow them to trounce the competition, all the dry cleaning stores that are already out there, uh, honestly, you'll give them their money. And how are you going to get your money back? Like, what, 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 as an investor, investors only care about one thing once they give you the money. When do I get my money back? And how much more of it do I get than I gave you? So, with a dry cleaning store, they're hard to sell. I mean, they, and, and when they sell, they don't sell for big multiples of what uh, people put into them. They're really cash generating businesses. So, they're great for the entrepreneur in generating cash, but not necessarily great for the investor. Now, this is why most of these small businesses, uh, they get loans because uh, they get loans based on their credit history and all sorts of other things and relationships they have because loans are very clear and the company, they, the, the company doesn't have to exit. And by exit, I mean either it, somebody buys it or it goes IPO. So this dry cleaning business, you know, people buy companies uh, when they, usually they buy companies when they are f growing really fast. Like that's why they buy them because they're going to be a big business and that's why they pay a lot of money. So you can invest in a family restaurant, a dry cleaning business, a, a flower shop, all sorts of little businesses, but it's going to be high risk. And, and if you get money back, it's probably not going to be a lot. Now, there are ways to structure these deals that can make them more attractive. You can do revenue sharing. You can do um, uh, other ways of structuring them that can make them more lucrative for you. But honestly, the really smart investors who want to get a great return look for fast growing companies because they know it. First of all, um, there is if it's growing fast at some point, it's either going to go public or somebody's going to buy it. If that's just inevitable. And if it's not, it's just going to, you know, chug along, uh, you know, making maybe making some money, maybe losing some money, but for years and years and years. And as an investor, you want to turn it over. You want to get those companies that are going to have big exits, but are going to move fast. And then you can take that money and it becomes liquid again, because what you want is the money liquid. So you can start reinvesting it. The other thing is that if a company isn't growing and scaling fast, it's hard for it to get other investors. So if it runs into trouble, runs into a speed bump, you know, if there's some, something bad happens, they might, they'll come back to you for more money, but it's going to be very hard for them to get other people to put in money, especially anybody who's a smart investor. They're not, they're not, you know, when that company has trouble, they're, 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 it's not growing fast. They're never, they're going to walk away. So in Silicon Valley, what we found is there's kind of a feeding chain. You know, the angel investors come in early, give the startup some money, then the seed investors come in, then the series A, then the series B, and so on. And the investors get bigger and bigger and bigger along the way. And as it gets bigger, the company gets diluted, but also the, the company grows. And, and that growth is what you're after. When I'm investing, I don't necessarily think about the exit a lot. I'm really looking at the company itself. Because really the exits, there's only so many ways you can exit. And the most common ways are a bigger company acquires you, right? Acquires the, the, the startup or the startup is on the road to going public in some form. So either through a SPAC that's been popular lately, but the, the shine is sort of worn off or they go public through traditional means. Now, there are other ways you can actually sell your shares to other investors along the way. But in order for that to happen, the company already has to be heading towards one of those two exits, an IPO or an acquisition. They, it has to sort of be a, a sure thing. Then you can start to sell your shares early to other investors. Now, um, in a startup, I, the reason I don't look at the exit is because the ex, it's very simple. Like it's, it's going to be on one of those two paths. But what matters is the value creation. What is this startup contributing to the world? Are they contributing something that is super valuable? Because the more valuable that is, and the more people that really want it and are willing to pay for it, in, either with their time or their cash, then that means that that exit is more guaranteed. So in a, in a sense, I'm looking at the exit, but I'm looking from, at what chance and how quickly will this company reach the exit? So I know it, you know, if I'm, if I don't think there's an exit, I'm not investing.
period, right? There's no investment. If I think there's an exit, the question is, how big will this grow and how fast can I get my money back? I analyze startups based on the winner take all mentality because that is usually the case. And even if there's a second place startup, you know, somebody besides Google um, that's out there uh, that has a search engine, um, they're usually exponentially smaller than the big fish. And that is because uh, technology uh, actually creates, can create an environment where we have what's called a network effect. Now, a network effect is really important to understand because a network effect means the more people you have participating on a platform, let's say whether it's Google or Facebook or Twitter or Amazon, you name it, a platform, the more people participating on it, the more valuable that platform becomes. And that value then diminishes the value of all the com competitors because people usually, they don't have time to participate on multiple platforms. Like if they're gonna search, they usually always go to the same site. Google, if they're gonna buy a product and they're you know, an Amazon fan, they're always going to Amazon. They're usually not searching around. Now, the network effect is a two-sided effect. So basically, like on Amazon, I can tell you, basically you have your buyers and your sellers. So the buyers, when you're a buyer and you go on Amazon, you want a lot of sellers so you can get the lowest possible price in the greatest selection. And as a seller, what you want is a lot of buyers. So the, the, the network effect is the more buyers and sellers are on the same platform, that platform becomes the place to go to get the best deals and make the most money. And that becomes a very hard thing to beat. Same with Facebook. It's your friends. Like the value on Facebook is connecting with your other friends. If they aren't, if they, if, if another social network pops up tomorrow, unless they offer something different, a different way of doing stuff, like Instagram offered basically social networking on mobile, same with WhatsApp. So Facebook had to buy them in order to uh, participate in that market because even though it was big on the web, it wasn't big on these new platforms and they also had their own network effect. This in, this is why it's a winner take all world because technology enables these type of transactions and the big fish end up gobbling up everybody else and it's like it's like gravitational pull they suck everybody into their orbit so um if a startup comes to me and i talk to a startup and i go how can you be number one in your market that's always my question how can you be number one and if they say look i'm not going to be number one we may be two or three i walk away like, I, I don't invest. And I will tell you why. Because if they tell you they're going to be two or three, they're probably going to be 10, 12, or 13. They're not even going to be close. Because there are, another, there are other competitors out there who are also gunning for number one and think they can be number one. And they may be two or three. And we know um, in most investor portfolios, if you look at venture capitalists or even angel investors, their portfolio, usually they might invest in 10 companies. And usually one of those companies, the one that hits it right, the one that grows like crazy, that company is worth more than all their other investments combined. So then um, the winner take all mentality is when we're an investor, we know all we need is one winner out of our portfolio, one big winner, and it will pay for all the losers and all the ones who earn just a little money. So we're always looking for that big bet because Look at Amazon, like just look at Google, look at Facebook, look at how much they are worth compared to all their competitors. It's this, um, this dynamic plays out over and over and over again. And with new technologies, it's going to continue. I tell them, sp spread your money out, but not too widely. Like don't, um, don't, uh, don't try to invest in everything because you don't have time. And you're just gonna, you need to go deep on these startups. It's more important to focus on a few areas, preferably areas you know extremely well. Like if you're a doctor, maybe it's the medical field. If you're a dentist, maybe it's de startups in dentistry or your lawyer, you know, legal startups. Um, focus in an area that you have some expertise and you have a deep network in. And then um, pick, don't put all your money in one pot, first of all, because you never know. No matter how sure a deal seems, these are usually early stage startups, and that means there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot more you don't know than you do know. 
and what you don't know can hurt you and you don't even know it. So I tell them, um, you, first of all, when investing, um, look at your total net worth, like how much money you have to invest. And don't go, if you're investing in angel, uh, early stage, you're an angel investor, early stage startups, don't go over 10%. Like 10% uh, of your capital should go into early stage startups. And the other 90% should go into stocks and bonds and whatever else you're interested. Real estate doesn't matter. Um, but take that 10% uh, maximum and then maybe pick 10 companies. Say over, you know, I'm going to go for 10 companies with this 10%. I'm going to go really deep and I'm going to take my time. I'm not going to rush. So I'm going to put 1%, be disciplined, like have a plan. I'm going to put 1% into, into the top 10 companies that I find over the next five years. That's my plan. And um, that is a good strategy. And it's a good strategy also when you're new to start off smaller, like start with very small investments uh, and then work your way up to larger ones. So maybe, um, you know, if you're experienced, you can start with the same size investments. I know a lot of angel investors and they will, you, a lot of them say, I will invest 150K in every company I, I participate in and I will put in my time and I'll make sure I get a decent, uh, the val valuation of the company is very important. We can talk about that really important to understand the valuation and then they will um, put in, um, they will be disciplined, they'll put in this 150K to every company. If you're starting out brand new, I tell you maybe start with 25K and work your way up to 150K. As a deal progresses from the angel stage, you know, to the seed round, to the pre-series A, to the series A and series B, there will always be dilution. You cannot write into the contract that well, if you do, if you get the startup to agree to a no dilution policy, you will have a very hard time getting any other investors. Like literally, you will, you'll be hurting the startup and hurting your own investment. So you have to be prepared for dilution. Fortunately, if you negotiate a decent deal, the valuation of the company at the time you invest is much lower. So um, in Silicon Valley and around the world right now, uh, when... Uh, Investors invest, a lot of times they will put a cap on the valuation, meaning that if I invest early, we are going to cap the valuation at, let's say, a million dollars. So if I put in 150K on a million dollar valuation, I own something substantial. I own a substantial percentage of this company, meaning I'm, that is the way I'm protecting myself against dilution. So as the startup grows and as they raise millions and millions of dollars, they're getting diluted. And the typical, uh, typically in most rounds, uh, past the angel round and the seed round, as it gets more standardized later on, the investors, the venture capitalists will take a 20% stake. So they will usually take a steady 20% stake from round to round. That's true here in the United States, especially Silicon Valley. So that means you can kind of estimate the dilution looking at, you know, how many rounds of investment are they going to need before they get acquired or go public and whether people are investing 5 million, 50 million or 500 million, you know, at each stage, they're usually taking another 20%. It's just that the value of the company has become so big that like for 500 million, you're only getting a 20% stake. Whereas an angel investor, you might get that same stake for 50 or 100 or $200,000, it depends. So um, that the, the, a, a lot of times um, investors will really um, look at the valuation that they're getting in terms of capping the round at a valuation that will protect them against dilution. And a problem right now, honestly, in Silicon Valley especially, is that valuations are sky high, even at an early stage. We are seeing crazy high valuations, which means you might put in 150K, but the company may already be worth 15 million. They're valuing themselves at 15 million. And in that case, with all the dilution that's going to happen in the life of this company, it makes it really hard to get a big win. So the ROI become, often doesn't make sense. So valuation does matter. I mean, people think it doesn't matter. It doesn't, but it does because not all your investments are going to be hits. And if you get a hit, you need it. You need the payoff to be big enough to pay for all the losers and still make a, a return that was worth it. Valuations are tricky. Now, the fact is that 
the entrepreneurs are just making up the valuations. They are literally pulling them out of a hat and saying, this is my valuation. Do you want to invest? And that's why when the market is really hot, like it is right now in Silicon Valley, the valuations are sky high. Like there's startups with almost nothing, like just a business plan, a team, and maybe they're barely launching their product. They're getting like $20 million valuations. Absolutely crazy. Makes it really hard for angel investors to get much money out of it, even if the company's successful. This is um, what you, to understand valuations, you need to look at it um, like, let me give you an analogy that most people can understand. Real estate. Like, what is a house worth? Like, a house could, you know, first of all, it depends on where the house is. If the house is in the middle of the desert, the Nevada desert, it's probably worth far less than if the house is in New York or San Francisco. It's probably worth exponentially more. Why is it worth so much more? Well, um, there's a lot of people who want to live there. There's a lot of demand for that house. So in the same way uh, with startups, if a startup's off in Estonia or some other part of the world, South Africa, the valuation is gonna be totally different than if the startup is in Silicon Valley or Beijing, first of all. It's just like a house in each of those locations. Secondly, how do you know what the startup is worth? Um, how do you know what a house is worth? Well, the way investors know is they look at all the other houses in the neighborhood. What are they selling for? Are, you know, what's their valuation? Entrepreneurs are doing the same thing. So when I say the entrepreneur pulls the valuation out of a hat, they, are, they don't really have proof because especially at an early stage, you know, the startup probably ha hardly has any revenue, if any, and any user growth, if any. Um, so the, what they're doing is they're looking at what all the other startups in the neighborhood are getting funded at. And then they're basing their valuation on that. Investors are doing the same thing. Does this mean that the valuation is really worth it for the angel investor? Well, that's a big question. What it does mean is that this is what the market commands. So it's a supply and demand thing. You know, you have the supply of money, like there's a lot of money that's flowed into venture capital recently, and the supply of entrepreneurs, new ideas that have potential. And it's a balancing of those two things. If there's a scarcity of, of great entrepreneurs that, or an entrepreneur has like an incredible idea, then their valuation is going to be higher because a lot of money is going to be competing for that. What you need to understand is I always say, you know, what you, what you want uh, usually at an angel round, you want to be getting a meaningful percentage, right? You, for, for your money, if it's very early, very risky, you know, you don't want to be getting, you know, less than like 5% uh, of the company, you want to be getting something substantial uh, for your investment to make it worth the risk. Um, later, uh, when you're analyzing the startup though, uh, what you have to understand is that there's a market out there. And if you are too, too, if you want to participate, you have to sort of pay the going rate. Otherwise, you're not going to get great startups. And if you don't get the, the best startups, you've already lost. It doesn't matter if you get a great valuation, if the startup isn't great, like you've lost your money. It's, it's a no-go. It's a better to invest at a higher valuation in a, in a great startup than get a great deal on a mediocre startup, plain and simple. But um, there is a limit and uh, it really pays to run the numbers. Now I can't do that uh, for you right now because it's kind of complex, but you can talk to other experienced investors and you can, you know, this is why I say, Get involved in an angel group. Angel groups, uh, especially with experienced angels who have done it before, they get a sense because they've gotten their returns and they know when they've, the valuations are too high and they've overpaid and they've really had a great startup, but it didn't amount to much. They may get 2X or 3X or 4X the return, but the risk was so much higher. They're like, they know when to back away from a deal. So um, in the scheme of things, um, the most important thing you can do in understanding what's a good valuation and what's not a good valuation is to actually work with more experienced angel investors, follow them, understand what they're doing, understand how they're evaluating startups. You can do this online or offline. I prefer doing it both. You do it offline and then you can go online to sites like AngelList and AngelCo. And as an investor, if you're an accredited investor, you can actually see the valuations of all the startups listing there. So you can compare valuations and start to get a sense for the market. Really important thing to do before you place down any money. My final thoughts are um, when you're investing, uh, be prepared to lose your money at the beginning because you don't know what you're doing. 
Be prepared to invest most of your time at the very beginning of becoming an angel investor in actually not looking for startups, but looking for other experienced angel investors who have done well in the past and learning from them. That is the most important thing you can do. Like, consider it a learning ex experiment at the beginning and keep the amount of money you put in limited and just, um, and, and keep it, like I said, uh, limit everything, like the total amount of money you're going to invest over a year and don't let anybody talk you out of going over that limit because that is deadly. There, you know, there are scams out there. There are people out there who honestly believe that they know what they're doing, but they really don't. And you might think they know what they're doing. So finding the right people is the number one thing you need to do. You should invest all your time into finding the right people, watching them, understanding them, learning from them, work, collaborating with them. That is where you should put your time. Forget about uh, finding the right investments right away. And then once you do that, um, you should also educate yourself online. There are lots of good uh, materials out there, lots of good books, lots of good videos, lots of good websites. You should constantly be educating yourself. The beauty of the internet is all this information is out there. If you're smart, you can figure it out. It just requires your time. I hope you enjoyed the talk. If you liked it, share it with your friends or subscribe to our channel. You can also come to founderspace.com and check out our three month online startup program well as my books, Make Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, and The Five Forces. I'm also available on all the major social networks. Just search for Founderspace.